So, some of the black college athletes seem to be pushing back against white supremacy. I'm surprised, and at the same time, not. In many ways, I feel this is, in part, the culmination of many events, such as the SAE fraternity racists. Black athletes said those racist punks ruined it for all of you. And that seems to be true. Tim Wolf is a dyed-in-the-wool race soldier. He deliberately ignored the continuing pleas of the black students for him to take on campus racism directly. He turned his back on them, literally gave what everyone recognized to be insincere and meaningless statements about racism is bad, etc. The whole campus knew that he was thumbing his nose at them. And now he's gone. And make no mistake, the only reason that Tim Wolf is out of a job is because he refused to do his job. And it's hilarious watching the white supremacists in the media trying to make excuses for him. Because whenever they do, they have to talk about the swastika smeared on the wall of one of the dorms. Kind of hard to do the old Negroes are overreacting routine when that's the kind of behavior white students are engaging in. But none of them can deny that black men stood up and the white supremacists stood down. I was especially delighted to see Rush the racist Limbaugh howling with rage about all this. After all, he's from Missouri, Cape Girardeau to be exact. I think now people understand why he decided to move to Florida. The reason you see so many whites raging about this is because this was not just black people getting what they want, but black men telling white men what to do, and the white men tripping over their own shoelaces scrambling to do it. Most white people know they have more in common with Tim Wolf's silent support for racism or with the campus racists themselves than they do with the college kids who protested it. So to see black men demand and get the head of a white university president because he deliberately enabled and supported the racists, that's something every white person has seen and fears. But be warned, when something like this happens, the white supremacists have to retaliate. This is not merely a loss, it's a humiliating defeat. They look exactly like what they are frightened bigots running for their lives when black men say jump. Don't be surprised when the white supremacists do something big and ugly in response to this. This is exactly what Jason and I have been telling you. You want to hurt white supremacy? Hit them in their pockets. But it's not enough to merely sting them. You have to go for the jugular. That's how you get the bastards to move. And the effect on the white public has been equally significant. Black athletes have been white people's go-to shield to deflect any attention from racism. Whenever black people point out that institutional poverty is inflicted on us by white supremacy, whites always point to the NBA and NFL as their only examples of a group of financially well-off black people. What goes unsaid, however, is that neither the NBA nor NFL players ever gets out of line. Sure, they're well paid but they're also well-controlled, too. White people know this. That's why they don't point to black rappers or comedians, two groups of black people who make their money assailing the white establishment. To whites, the black athlete is a socioeconomic and racial trophy. He's a safe Negro because he's a dumb brute, only intelligent enough to play games, and he owes everything to the whites who put him out there in the first place. But there seems to be some problems as of late. The white supremacists are reading a greater social context into all this, and that's made them angry and understandably so. After Trayvon Martin was murdered, the Miami Heat demonstrated. The St. Louis Rams after Mike Brown was murdered. The entire NBA and NFL after Eric Garner. The black athlete rebellions have gotten bigger and more confrontational. The Missouri player strike, however, represents something else entirely. Black athletes who are not just demonstrating, but making demands. Whites understand this as a watershed event, particularly if it catches on. When you see the white pundits and white racist apologists worrying about black athletes flexing their financial muscles nationwide, they aren't exaggerating. They are deathly afraid of this. 
when you hit white supremacy and its wallet, you've declared war on them. So expect to see a retaliatory strike, and sooner rather than later. The white collective psyche has sustained an enormous blow. White people take a special pride in knowing black athletes don't challenge them. Black athleticism represents the most visible expression of black manhood, undeniable blackness, undeniable dominance. So when those black men cower before whites and fall silent in the face of white aggression, whites take comfort in that. To them, they've broken the most intimidating black figure imaginable and turned him into a house pet. The black athlete in most cases can't think beyond their sport. I did an entire video series about this, by the way. Black athletes simply don't understand that in a system of white supremacy, everything is part of it either sustaining it physically or psychologically. Donald Sterling described the Clippers players as his slaves, who he clothed and fed. And this is how the white public at large sees them too. When a white man is successful, he owes nothing to anyone. But when a black man is successful, he owes everything to white people, and he had better let them know how grateful he is. Forty million dollar slaves wasn't just the title of a book. It is the dynamic that exists between black athletes and the white public. If this trend continues, there won't be any white people pointing to pro athletes as examples of black success. Whites see their most well-pampered pets rebelling against them. Missouri U had no choice but to give in. The sports programs are the money makers for the universities. I had an exchange just today with a white woman who claimed colleges aren't in the business of sports, they're in the business of education. <laughs> what an idiot. If universities were all about education, then why is it that they build mega million dollar stadiums for their sports teams, but don't build mega million dollar labs for their science programs? They recruit top-flight coaching staff for the basketball and football teams, but don't give a damn about hiring competent scientists for their academic programs. The black athletes bring the universities massive income and prestige. Not their science programs. Not their law programs. Not their drama or political science programs. Sports is what colleges are all about. How much money and personnel are devoted to recruiting academic enrollees? Almost none. Now, how much money and how many people are devoted to recruiting black athletic enrollees? It's an industry unto itself. So for all the whites out there still trying to convince themselves that you matter somehow to the university, you don't. Get over it. Unless your school's name is Harvard or Yale, it's the black athletes that make your university worth going to. When people talk about Notre Dame or Miami U or LSU, they don't talk about anything other than their sports programs. Black kids from nowhere can walk onto your campus and make the entire university system bow down to them because of that. You'll never see any of those white legacy admissions have that kind of pull. A white student on Missouri campus simply isn't necessary because he doesn't bring anything to the school other than a tuition, and everybody brings that. Tuition fees are through the roof, while academic performance is through the floor. The black athletes have always had the power, which is why the schools spend so much time threatening these young men's futures, making it clear that one phone call can ruin their lives before they've even begun. Missouri U's administration knew there was far too much money at stake for the school to risk missing even one game. And how quickly they caved in proves the money these black athletes bring in is more important than anything, more important than even the white university leaders themselves. During the Ferguson and Baltimore uprisings, the white supremacists in the media were complaining that the protesters should have remained peaceful. When the Baltimore uprising led to police indictments, it was mob rule coerced by violence. In this case, no violence, no property damage, and it got results. You would think at the very least, the white supremacists in the media would be encouraging this. But guess what they're saying instead? Mob rule coerced by political correctness. Mob rule, by the way, is white code for black people have enough support to affect change, and we don't like it. Wah! 
what white people call mob rule is what the history books call democracy. But as Dr. John Henrik Clark said, if we had democracy for even a single day in America, white supremacy would fall before sundown. The white supremacists are more angry about this than they were about Baltimore. Baltimore was the black community exerting control over a place where black people live. Now black men are exerting control over where white men live, over a place where white men thought they were in control. So we see the problem isn't whether black people are causing a civil disturbance or not. It's about keeping black people from affecting any changes. Oh, I fully understand why the white supremacists are furious. It's a race war out there, and they lost this fight in record time. And as we keep telling you, every defeat fuels the next defeat. They can't keep sustaining losses this big and expect white supremacy to remain standing. Sooner or later, white supremacy will be required to make serious concessions. White supremacy's ability to maintain the support of the rank-and-file whites has always been the unspoken understanding that as long as the whites hang together, then no matter how lazy, dumb, or corrupt they are, they will always remain at the top. For the white public at large, white supremacy is a glass floor, keeping them from ever falling to the bottom. Without it, as Tim Wolfe has shown us, a lot of white people, the majority in fact, know that nothing would keep them from falling into oblivion. So they've decided not to toss one another overboard. But there's no honor among these thieves. If black power puts their backs to the wall, they'll turn on one another. All that's been lacking is for us to apply the pressure. Well, today you've seen what happens when the pressure is applied. And it's not because of any useless appeals to white conscience or any civil rights fossils coming down and yelling in front of any cameras. Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton are officially obsolete, as are their would-be new successors. Hucksters like Sharpton and Jackson served a very important purpose for white supremacy. They mislead the black population with loud, pointless speeches and serve to focus the anger and collective racial will of the white population. If you're a white ruler looking to control a multiracial society, then you must have all-purpose tools you can use to manipulate the masses on multiple levels. People who are perceived one way to one group of people while being perceived exactly the opposite by another. If Jackson or Sharpton were truly any threat to white supremacy, they would have been killed, imprisoned, or otherwise disposed of a long time ago. They would not have book deals in TV shows. Sock puppets like Jackson and Sharpton are not merely desirable to white supremacy, they're absolutely indispensable. But not anymore. If anyone had any doubts as to whether these tools of white supremacy were irrelevant, now you have your answer. Just the optics alone are incredible. Black men demanding a white institution hand them a white man's head on a platter, and then the whites falling over themselves to do it. The whites can try to make themselves feel better by claiming this was political correctness or mob rule or whatever other whining they want to do, but they know the truth. Black men leveraged economics and whites peed their pants. This is an example of black power. A reproducible example, which is what they really fear. Let me end by saluting the millennials. Ever since Jenna, Louisiana, we've seen the young people using social media and their own 21st century savvy to make changes. It was the young people who made the streets of Ferguson and Baltimore too hot for white supremacy. The young people who demanded and got Justine Sacco, Erica Escalante, and now Tim Wolf fired. The worthless elders, and I'm sorry to say, my own increasingly useless Generation X, deserve no credit or admiration. Generation X should have been fighting these battles during the late 80s and throughout the 90s, but we didn't. Yet some of us call the millennials the twerk generation, the slacker generation. Well, we're being shown up by the twerkers and slackers, so what does that make us? These are the people who will write our page in history. When it comes time to talk about what lessons they learned from us, what we did that inspired them, what do you think they'll say about us? What have we given to them that they should admire us for? 
Nothing. Absolutely nothing. When they write our page in history, that's what it will say. Many of the young people seem to understand that those in power don't do what's right on the basis of morality. We don't live in a just society. We live under a system of white supremacy, that is to say pure barbarism. We don't have the rule of law. Under white supremacy, it's the rule of the jungle. Those in power only understand force. If your demands don't have the credible threat of force behind them, they will ignore you. If the demands do have the credible threat of force, they will immediately obey you. That's how the world works under white supremacy. And I'm very glad to see that, in this case, the young people get it. Let us hope that they continue to use their power this way.